Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Physical Therapy San Pedro podcast. I am your host, Dr. Janae Brown, and today we are going to be covering anterior hip pain, causes and treatment. I'm joined by my favorite physical therapist. To my left is Dr. Bay. And to my right, we have someone new joining us. This is Dr. Yana. She has joined our team this week, and we are super excited to have her on board with us. Um, as you guys see, the boys are not here. Dr. Daisuke and Dr. Sanaval have transitioned on. We have a lot of change happening um, in the beginning of this year, but we wish them all the best. Um, Dr. Yana has joined us, and she'll, she will be joining us um, in our podcasts going forward. So um, this is her first one, so we're going to be nice to her, right, Dr. Bay? <laughs> Yes, very. <laughs> we're going to do our best. <laughs> so we're talking about anterior hip pain today. There are a lot of people who experience anterior hip pain, and there's a lot of causes for it. Um, so I'm, we're going to cover kind of all the reasons that you might be having some anterior hip pain and maybe some simple things that you can start doing right away to address those things. Um, and we are going to start with anatomy. Um, I chose to do this blog because... Um, I see a lot of people with like anterior hip pain. I think that's like a a big one that I see. And I feel like I'm always trying to fix that. And it's a struggle sometimes depending on the type of anterior hip pain they have. So I feel like it's always a challenge for me um, to get rid of that and to really help control people who have uh, control like the symptoms from progressing for people who have it and kind of modify their activity and things like that. So I like this area in this region. So I chose to write this blog. So Dr. Yana is going to start us off with um, anatomy. And so because we're being nice to her, she gets to have anatomy <laughs> today. <laughs> it's the favorite. It's the favorite. Yeah. So Dr. Yana, go ahead and start us off. Talk to us about the hip anatomy sort of, um, let us know what it's all about. Yeah. All right. Okay. So we're today we're going to be using our model here, Labone James, go Lakers. <laughs> and we're going to start <laughs> with the pelvic structures. So this is our pelvis. We have a right side and a left side. And, um, the important thing about the pelvis is it's responsible to, uh, of connecting like the upper trunk with the lower limbs and within all that it are important structure structures like muscles, tendons, and ligaments. So we'll go over the muscles first. So in the front part of our, uh, hips, we have our hip flexors. There's a very large muscle called the iliopsoas that begins at the lumbar spine here. It comes all the way down through the pelvis and attaches at the top of the femur here. So that would be the iliopsoas. And then up here, kind of like in the bowl aspect of the pelvis would be your iliacus. And then on the side of our hips, we have our hip abductors. So muscles like our gluteus medius sit back here or towards the side. And then we also have hip extensors, which you're gonna find in the back of the pelvis, like our glute max. And then we have um, our TFL as well. So that's kind of like in the front and reaches down to the femur as well. And that's uh, responsible for motions like abduction and internal rotation. And then as far as ligaments go, those are the structures that connect our bones together. So we have our iliofemoral, which um, when it comes to ligament names, they can be kind of complex at first. But it's they if you break it down, it'll start like at the pelvis and then it ends somewhere um, either on the femur. It kind of tells you in the name. So iliofemoral meaning starts at the ilium and then comes down to the femur. And then um, another one, a common one is a pubofemoral ligament. And then another important part of the hip structure is the blood supply. So um, there are a lot of arteries and veins that run through here, but the main one being the femoral nerve. Or sorry, femoral artery and nerve. <laughs> yeah, both of them go there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the hip is a complex like joint. I feel like it's complex like the shoulder, right? So it's like it's a ball and socket um, joint and um, it's got like a lot of stuff going around it and through it. Um, yeah, so it's a fun one. I think Dr. Bay's favorite, one of her favorite joints is the hip. Yep. It is. <laughs> See, she's not just a foot girl. No. She's also a hip girl. Yes, thank you for acknowledging that. <laughs> All right, I'm going to talk about the five special reasons that you might be having anterior hip pain. Um, these are things that you might have heard of before. 
It might be some things that you've never heard of. So I'm going to cover them um, pretty briefly, just go over some of the um, causes and some of the symptoms. And then we're going to talk a little bit about what you can do about this stuff. So the five major reasons that you might have some anterior hip pain are muscle strains, hip flexor tendinopathy, osteoarthritis, a labral tear, or hip impingement. So we'll start with muscle strains. Muscle strains are just basically an overstretching or tearing of a muscle that is in sort of the hip complex. So that could be any muscle that Dr. Yana mentioned, maybe your um, your one of your glutes, glute med, glute min, glute, bat, glute max, maybe your ilio, um, psoas, maybe your rectus femoris, could be kind of anything in there, even some of the deep muscles that are really, really tiny in there. Um, so when you when you basically strain a muscle, stretch it or tear it, um, that can be very painful in the region really of wherever that muscle tear or strain is. So you might have some pain, some bruising. You're definitely going to have some weak weakness in that muscle group. So if it's a hip abductor, like the gluteus medius, you know, you might have weakness in that muscle group because that muscle is strained or torn. Um, you'll have maybe some bruising, which is not very common, but sometimes if it's a really bad, um, tear, you will have some bruising. You'll have a limited range of motion because that muscle is sort of weak and it doesn't want to do the things that you want it to do. So um, that will um, happen as well. We commonly will uh, strain a muscle from usually overuse or repetitive stress um, or which we find in kind of sports like long distance running and um, soccer. Those are some common um, sports that we might see some overuse in um, or sudden twists or turn in sports. So those are some common ways you can um, strain a muscle group. The second one we're going to talk about is hip flexor tendinopathy. This is probably one you guys are hearing a lot about right now. People talk about um, I have, you know, a hip flexor pain or my hip flexors are tight. Um, and a lot of times it's because of what we call hip flexor tendinopathy. So um, hip flexor tendinopathy is basically just irritation of the tendon. The tendon, uh, um, hip flexor tendon connects basically the muscle to the bone. And so the hip flexor is the iliopsoas, which is a combination of the iliacus muscle and the psoas muscle. And those form basically a, a tendon that attaches on the femur. And that muscle flexes your hip. It makes your knee kind of come up. You want to show them, Dr. Yana? Yep. So you're, it'll bring your knee up like that, which is hip flexion. So if you have tendinopathy in that hip flexor, Great demonstration. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> um, so if you have a tendinopathy in that hip flexor, then um, you just might have pain localized in that area um, in where that tendon attaches at. You might have um, swelling around it. You might have stiffness in your hip joint. And you definitely will have weakness in your hip flexor muscles or, or, or flexing your hip in that uh, muscle group. Um, you can get a hip flexor tendinopathy from overuse, um, repetitive, a repetitive strain on the muscle. Um, if you have poor movement mechanics or poor biomechanics, that might be a reason why you um, uh, have some hip flexor tendinopathy, sudden in injuries, and then you can also get it from an inadequate warmup, which many of our athletes have these days. So we see this quite commonly um, in our practice. Um, the third thing that uh, is commonly a contributor contributor for anterior hip pain is hip impingement, and these two kind of get a little bit confused sometimes. Hip impingement and hip flexor tendinopathy, um, but hip hip impingement is a true sort of um, anatomical issue. So you'll have a hip flexor impingement if you have an overgrowth in sort of the bone that um, is around your hip. So usually it's a um, growth on the acetabulum, which is the the circular portion of the pelvis or where, where the ball goes into the socket on the pelvis. Um, and depending on where that growth is, is how we sort of name that type of hip impingement. So there are three different types um, of impingement and we classify that um, the impingement by where it is. Um, typically, if someone has hip impingement, um, there will be uh, radiological reports that will be involved. So we'll have an uh, x-rays, MRIs that will kind of give us information about the bone growth. Um, and so, and that's really important for us to know because we approach sort of the treatment and the care differently if someone has um, hip impingement versus sort of hip 
flexor tendinopathy. Um, so some reason, reasons you might have it is you might be genetically predisposed to that. So anatomically, the way your hips are and pelvis are positioned could put you in a position where you're already going to have that. Um, maybe your hips develop abnormally. So depending on how you developed, you know, in the womb or as a child or things that you did when you're younger. Um, and then also you can develop this from actually repetitive stress on the hips. Um, and it, with basically sports that involve hip uh, flexion and rotation. So if you're doing a sport that sort of does that over and over again, you can kind of create this problem as well. So you got to be careful with that. Um, if you have hip impingement, you're going to have some similar symptoms to a hip um, tendinopathy or hip flexor tendinopathy. So you might have some catching or clicking sensation in your hip, stiffness in your hip joint, decreased range of motion, and then you'll have pain with like certain rotational movements um, in the hip and with certain activities that involve um, combined motions in the hip. Our fourth um, condition that often we see uh, is a contributor to anterior hip pain is osteoarthritis. And you guys probably are very familiar with this. Everybody knows what osteoarthritis is or OA is. Um, and basically, this is something that often develops with time, with age, is typically when we start to see it as we get older, our, our bones get older too. So um, we start to see wearing on the surfaces of the joints and in the in, inside of the hip socket um, and wear of the cartilage sort of in that area. So um, with hip OA, you know, it's basically aging joint overuse. Sometimes you're gen you're genetically predisposed to having osteoarthritis a little earlier. And then if you've ever had a joint injury, maybe you had some hip flexor tendinopathy or you have um, had a labral tear, tear or something like that, you can kind of push yourself along the continuum to having some some hip OA sooner. Um, and the and if you have hip OA, um, you're going to just, the biggest characteristic of this is just really a lot of stiffness in your hip joint and lack of mobility with movement. Um, you will sometimes have pain and swelling in that joint as well. So the last one we're going to cover, because I'm tired of talking, is, <laughs> and it is our last one, is a labral tear. And so um, the labrum, you have a labrum in your hip and you have a labrum in your shoulder, and it kind of lines um, inside that socket. Both of those are ball and socket joints. So that labrum provides us sort of um, a cushion for shock absorption in, in the hip. And so um, you can tear that labrum and you can tear it because of trauma. You can tear it from repetitive movements. Um, sometimes if you've had hip impingement, you can tear. That might lead you to tearing your labrum. Um, and again, some of the symptoms are similar to um, um, a hip impingement or a hip flexor tendinopathy, which would be clicking and popping, um, decreased motion in the hip, a catching or locking sensation, which is a little bit different, and then pain in the hip or groin area. So those are the five most common. I tried to give you guys a quick brief synopsis of it. five most common things um, that contribute to anterior hip pain. As we were saying, those things that might have stirred a little bit of, hmm, maybe it's that, that maybe that's what I'm going through. Um, Dr. Bay is going to talk to us a little bit about sort of some big general things we do to address these um, different conditions. And then we're going to go into a little bit of talking about how we might deal with each one a little bit differently. So Dr. Bay, Thank the floor you. is yours. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Good mm -hmm. job, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> There's a lot of great information you put yes. out. Um, so there's a lot of ways we can approach treatment. So we're going to kind of look at all parts of life to try to make sure we can help your hip heal. So the first of the eight ways that we can help treat your hip is to look at activity modification. What that means is we don't want to keep causing your pain over and over again because that makes it hard for your body to heal. So this doesn't mean abandon exercise or strength training or whatever your movement is, but let's change it so we can do it in a more of a pain-free manner. So if you think about the example of a squat, maybe you're not going to be squatting your bottom towards your heels anymore. If your hip starts pain halfway through, you're going to minimize that range to shorten it so you can still train, strength train through the pain-free motion. So that's an example of how we might modify activity to help our hip continue to heal. The next is more of a lifestyle modification, and you're going to want to make sure that you are thinking about the health of your hip all the time. So this means that you're going to continue your mobility work, your flexibility work, your strength training, everything to keep your hip moving. And you may even have to look at 
your diet to make sure you don't overload your hip joint. Make sure your weight remains managed, okay? The next is ice and anti-inflammatory medications, common things we use to keep pain and swelling down. Next is there's a lot of supplements out there that doctors might recommend for the health of your joint. Some people find them effective. Some don't notice a difference. But if you're one of those that finds it helpful and it can have you feeling better so you can participate more, that's a plus always. Next would be an injection to your joint. There are some medications out there that can help reduce pain and inflammation when they're directly injected into the socket of your hip to target some of the irritated, damaged, or painful tissues. So make sure to get screened and see if you're a candidate for any of that. Next would be the use of an assistive device. So it's very important, number one, to always be safe. So for example, I evaluated a patient last week that was coming with a couple of the conditions you mentioned, Dr. Brown, and (laughs) she mentioned that when she tries to get up from a chair, her leg gives out on her. So Mm -hmm. I go, okay, if you don't start to head in the right direction soon, we have to discuss an assistive device because your safety, right? If you take a bad fall, you might end up worse than what you have now. You might fracture your hip. So also, if just putting weight on your hip is causing it to worsen, you can unload it with a cane, a walker, a brace for support and stability. Those are all things that we might be used for a short period of time until we can gain certain things back and graduate back out of them. You can see the common goal here is can we kind of get the pain down? Can we start to restore more function? And what what are the parameters for that? So two more things. If we're having not having success with some of the things mentioned above and we go to the doctor, they might recommend surgery for our hip. There are some different arthroscopic procedures out there that can deal with hip impingement that Dr. Brown mentioned. It might be required to reshape some of the bones or smooth out some of the cartilage that were in the diagnosis that she mentioned. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing, which is our favorite one, where we like to intervene is physical therapy. Physical therapy is our favorite treatment of the hip. No matter what stage you're at in your care, surgical, non-surgical, just discovering your limitations, a physical therapist can step in and be of help. Um, there's three major phases we like to break down rehab into. So we're going to discuss the what we would do and focus on in the beginning, middle, and late stages of physical therapy. So if you're in a lot of acute pain, if you're maybe coming off an injury or a surgery, you're going to find yourself in that acute stage. And at this stage, we're really focusing on reducing pain, swelling, tenderness of the tissues, a bigger focus on improving the active range of motion, passive range of motion of your hip, flexibility of the muscles, mobility of the joint. As we graduate towards the middle phase, that becomes more of a strength-focused phase. We're going to be doing things to improve balance, stability, and control. And that final phase, when we're starting to feel really good, we're really thinking about what our goals are. So that's where we work on returning to sport, our exercises and trainings can be more focused on sport f- performance, how we can improve our power, speed, and agility. So physical therapy is going to differ for each of these conditions, but what you do know is that your therapist will be there to guide you the entire time and make it very specific for you and your condition. Yeah, good stuff, Dr. Bay. Mm-hmm. Okay, so of these conditions that you guys, we have listed here, do you guys have anybody on your currently on your caseload that has any of these right now? Do you guys have anybody or yeah? I do. The yeah. one I just evaled, she has labral tear, arthritis. Yeah. And um and I have a, a okay. patient that's recovering from a labral surgery. Oh, okay. Yeah. What else? Someone with a muscle tear. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A lot of them. Yeah. We know I like hips, (laughs) (laughs) not just feet. (laughs) So Dr. Bate, well, how might you treat, let's say you said have, you have someone with some hip OA, um, and a labral tear. So how might you treat somebody that has maybe OA different from somebody that has a labral tear? Mm. Is there anything different that you do? 
Well, the labral tear, I think we're going to be a little bit more limited because that cartilage is going to be potentially limiting how far I can push their flexibility. Mm-hmm. I'm, whereas a hip OA, I'm probably going to find just more of a need for general strengthening to support mm-hmm. the hip socket. Yeah. But the labrum, I'm going to have to be a little bit more creative in restoring their flexibility without irritating it, I think. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. They're both going to have decreased range of motion. And they're both going to need to probably be a little bit less load bearing Yeah, mm-hmm. in the initial phases. And an OA patient's going to have a little more decreased range of motion sort of everywhere, yeah, right? Versus globally. like your labral will have different, you know, decreased yeah. range of motion mostly into internal rotation, right? Um, and some of the rotational parts of, of movement, right? Yeah. Um, what about hip impingement versus hip flexor tendinopathy? What might... Do you guys have any ideas of how we might approach someone, I'm sorry, hip flexor tendinopathy versus a hip impingement or, yeah, those two? Is there anything you guys would do different between those those patients? Chime in if you want to, yeah. Thoughts? Yeah. I'm thinking. <laughs> I think if someone had a, like, a hip impingement and I knew they had, like, a cam impingement or something like that, I would be more careful with um, probably – getting into those deeper end ranges, like, um, especially because you know, they're going to hit a block, like, and they're, you're going to probably have the same thing with your tendinopathy, but your tendinopathy, they're going to be able to go there and it's not going to be like a hard end feel. It's going to be more of something they can get there, but it's irritable. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I would be more, I would probably move into those ranges a little easier, a little less worried about like the sort of the the, sh- the really intense pain that they're probably going to have when they get in those end ranges with a, a impingement essentially. Um, so that might be something that I approach a little bit differently with them. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, we're feeling joint and feel as we work with people. So I think that, um, we're going to be feeling that hard versus yeah. flexible and feel like yeah. you said. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what about a muscle strain versus, um, maybe what else do we have here? A muscle strain versus, um, maybe a hip flexor, like let's say hip flexor tendinopathy versus like a, a hip flexor strain, like a strain of your iliacus or your psoas or your rectus. Would, is there anything you guys would do differently in approaching those patients and how you would treat them? Thoughts? Um, I think it would depend if the strain was, um, uh, like when it happened. So if it's still in the acute phase, we would still want to be more careful and not um, push the patient to do more than they can tolerate in that moment versus a tendinopathy, which can kind of stay around a little bit longer. And um, I think they can handle more load with a tendinopathy. Of course, it depends who the patient is. Um, But with a strain, it's usually more acute. So you would want to be a little more careful um, on which phase of rehab you're focusing on. Yeah. Yeah, Definitely. Yeah. 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 So essentially what we want to share with you guys is that when you're, we're approaching each of these sort of conditions, there's are some things that we're going to do a little bit differently with each one of them. And I think the biggest thing is if you have anterior hip pain and you're not sure kind of what to do and you're not sure, you know, it could be as simple as modifying an activity like Dr. Bay explained, like, or maybe getting some weight off that hip, which can help reduce the pain. But it might be more complex where you need to be sort of graded back to the activities you're doing. And you might hit, keep hitting a wall. Like you keep squatting and you just keep having that hip, that anterior hip pain. You don't know why going to see a PT will help kind of get you going with like, what is the thing that you're doing that it keeps sort of contributing to the pain and what are the things that you need to kind of pull back from? And it's not always easy to know. Um, but we hope that we gave you guys some tools today to kind of figure out the differences between them and sort of some things you might be able to start implementing right away um, and do right away. So, um, yeah, I think that's all I have for them. Do you guys have any further thoughts or anything you want to share? No, that was really good. Just making sure you get in to get screened so you can get the personalized care you need. Yep. And you can come in and see us. We, um, if you live in the LA area, you can come in directly to see us. If you don't live in the LA area, we do telehealth so we can see you across the globe. Um, so you can get in for a session for that. You can also follow us on Instagram, Facebook. You can go check out our website at physicaltherapystpetro.com where our blog 
is listed at and you can read that whole thing. You can go on our YouTube page and kind of check out some other posts we have regarding, um, you know, other conditions that we've covered. We're in our hip series right now. So our next um, blog discussion is going to be, I don't know what our topic is, so stay tuned, <laughs> but um, it's going to be something on the hip. So, <laughs> but we have all kinds of great resources for you guys on YouTube. Um, we have our, this podcast on pretty much every listening platform that you'd want to listen to it. So go check that out as well. And um, we will see you guys next time. Thank you for tuning in. Bye. Bye. Bye.